So behind our house, we have this little gravel road. It goes back to what we call the barn. That's where Marisa said, if she sees my chickens, it's fried chicken lunch, okay? <laughs> so if y'all ever want a chicken dinner, just come over and let them out, run them up to the yard, and we'll have fried chicken. <laughs> so I have to keep them way back in the back. Well, way back in the back, there's critters, okay? So they, <clears throat> everything tastes like, I guess, and looks like chicken to all of God's creation. And they will take your chicken. So I have to protect them. I've got this little special thing I had to buy to put them in to keep the critters away. <clears throat> and as I walk back, I get up every morning at five and I go back to see, feed the chickens. And as I was going back there, I say my morning prayers. Well, there's an eight point buck standing right there beside me this morning. I don't know how he didn't smell me or anything like that. But <clears throat> so I just said, Amen, because I had finished my prayer. And he, he darted off. Well, then I couldn't see my chickens, so then you start thinking, okay, raccoons, possums, whatever. What got my chickens last night? But when the deer ran past them, they all stuck their head out, so I know they're good. <laughs> but <clears throat> getting some more chickens. Marisa would never let me have a rooster. She goes, you can have hens, but I don't want to hear a rooster. Well, across the holler, we call it the holler, our neighbors have a rooster. We named him Henry, Henry the rooster. And Henry goes off every morning about three o'clock, I guess, three or four o'clock. <clears throat> so I'm fixing to get some more, what they call Plymouth Rock chickens, they're beautiful birds. And Marisa said I could have a rooster only because the man that's selling to me when I was explaining what was happening, like when you let the chickens out to free range, mine free range all the way back in the woods and I have to go back there and route them up. It's like herding cats. You can't, chickens are like herding cats. You had to go get them. So he said, Paul, that's because you don't have a rooster. That's a rooster's job. So Marisa said I could have a rooster this time. So we named him, we haven't got him yet, but we're gonna name him Spartacus. <coughs> so, y'all come over, y'all can say Spartacus. <coughs> Okay, last week we uh, talked about Revelation 9 and got into 10, but we talked about the locust, the locust is uh, symbolism for the Roman army that's coming upon them, and the number there is, if you calculate that number, it was like 200 million. The point of that large number is they're going to decimate the, the Jewish nation. They are coming upon in God's wrath to decimate that whole nation. There, it's an unwinnable war. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what happened, I told you last week as Titus comes in, his men are getting frustrated. That's an understatement. As they attempt to come in, they, they know they have to take the zealots out of the temple in order to end this. <clears throat> and they make attempts by coming in through the fortress. They have built a siege ramp. Uh, the Z Jewish men and zealots had dug a tunnel under the siege ramp. They had set it on fire. The siege ramps collapsed. Uh, a lot of Roman soldiers died in that. So they decided to go around to the <clears throat> west side of the, t of the fortress, come in through the colonnade section there, come in and take that over. And they had set a trap for them and a lot more died. So they're getting severely frustrated. In fact, a group of the Roman soldiers one night decided we're just gonna go do this. And they gathered together and attempted it and were almost successful in their attempt to break into the temple area. <coughs> Titus takes that idea and says, well, if I'll just send a, a strong or just a lot of men through there, we can break in, and they did. And it, it took a little doing, but they, they got the zealots out. Well, the Roman soldiers were so frustrated that they say two of them took some torches and threw it inside the temple itself, and it caught on fire. And I told you it was like a feeding frenzy because of the gold melting and all that. <clears throat> There's two things that Titus said, hey, whatever, you know, just destroy it, whatever you want to do. And the other one, other says it. No, he actually tried to call the men off, but it had gone too far. 
because they got paid by the spoils of war. They got paid the gold that's coming through. That's, that's their payday. Titus gives them word to kill all that they come in contact. It didn't matter if you were a child. It didn't matter if you were a woman. It didn't matter if you were a man. You were to be killed. The Roman soldier had a sword. It's about two feet long and <clears throat> weighed about two, two and a half pounds. And the Roman soldier started going through, and if you were Jewish, they ran you through with their sword. <clears throat> they ran you through, and they found another, and they would run them through, and they would do it. They did it to the point where his commanders came to Titus and said, our men are tired of killing. At that point, they had killed 1.1 million Jews inside the city walls. And he said, okay, tell them only continue the killing if they can find a weapon on that person. So they went back and started killing again. It's a horrible scene to picture in your mind. It's even more horrible as you read about what they were doing. If you were 17 years or older, or 17, I'm sorry, 17 years or younger, you were to be sold as a slave. Man or teenager, woman and children. Estimate over 100,000 after the carnage took place were taken into slavery. That's not counting the others that were killed outside the walls of Jerusalem. That's not counting the ones that had crucified by jumping just to try to find food. It was something the world had never seen before. Now before that, remember we talked about all these partial judgments that God was sending to them, trying to get them to repent, and they would not. But the second part of that was God was trying to get the nations to look at God's wrath and repent. And we will find out they did not either. They would not. Titus is quoted as saying after, after they had taken the city of Jerusalem, after <coughs> everything had been expelled, after the killings that take place and the ones have been sold off, that he's walking around and he's looking and he's just seeing. And he uttered these words. I could not have done this if God had not intended for it to happen. So he did recognize. He did recognize that this was God's wrath that had been brought upon this nation. These people had died. He realized because this is God's wrath. He realized that this nation had fallen away from God. So God had intended for the nations to take notice and to repent. They would not, but they did recognize why this had come upon them. That amazes me, because then if I look around in our culture, you can talk to somebody. Do you believe in Jesus? They'll say yes. Do you believe in God's work? Well, now we're going to talk about that because that was written by men. Well, no, you don't believe that God's word is the inspired word of God? I believe it might have been at one time. Richard talked about it this morning, that people try to explain away the words of our God. They try to say, that's for you, but he's not gonna treat me that way. I'm special. Through the destruction of Jerusalem, we see the wrath of God. He wants us to come home. He wants us to repent. But it's your choice. He's not going to force you to happen. I told you that there's a man that told me one time, he said, I wish God would just do that. I wish he'd just take away my free will and say, you'll do what I say. And I said, no, God can't do that. He loves you too much. You have to choose to love God. You have to choose to obey God. <clears throat> you have to choose to come home. 
You have to choose to repent and obey. If not, this is the example that God has left for us to look at to say this is what's in store. You don't have to do it. You don't have to choose this. But this is the alternative to not coming back to him. Now, if more of our, our world would look at this example and say, I don't want that, what can I do? So there's a man the other day, his wife cleaned out a part of their house, said, I want you to take this down to Goodwill. It was a Saturday. There's football games on, right? For some of you. There's others of us, like I told you, <coughs> We have a basketball season in just a little bit. In fact, the high school basketball, uh, they had a little east-west thing going on or something. That was more attractive than my afternoon. Okay, now, <clears throat> he's a little ticked off because his wife said, take all this stuff down to Goodwill. We've got to get rid of it. But there's football on. Take it. So he's thinking supper, football, supper, football. I think I'll take this down to Goodwill. So he gets down there and said, I'm going to make the most out of my day. <clears throat> Young man comes out to help him unload his pickup truck. And <clears throat> he says, how's your day going? He says, well, it's supposed to be football. Wife said, bring this down here. <clears throat> and he said, I know. He said, my day's not been going too good either. <clears throat> and he said, well, speaking of your day, how is your relationship with Jesus? And he said, it could be better. And he said, would you like to have a, a Bible study? And the young man at Goodwill said, yes, you know, I've, I've been waiting for years for somebody to ask me into a Bible study. I would. So football in that man's mind is gone, right? And he sat down and studied the Bible with that man at the Goodwill store. The Goodwill is now a brother, in your, a brother of Christ. Okay. So something that don't want to be here, don't want to take this stuff down there, football games are on, there are a lot more things that are important. That man is going to avoid the wrath of God because the other one went to Goodwill. Isn't that amazing? We can do that every day. <clears throat> there is somebody coming into your path, into your life that is just brushing through and all you got to do is say, how is your relationship with God? How's your relationship with Jesus? You would be amazed how many people say it could be better. Would you like to study God's Word? Yes. They can avoid this. We can avoid this just by being faithfully obedient to God. So, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So what he's saying is John sees another mighty angel. This angel is someone that we have not seen a description of before. And he's not like the other angels that we've looked at or read about in the book. And he's wrapped in a cloud. Anytime you see the word cloud, Old Testament, New Testament, you are seeing God's judgment. This man is wrapped, this angel is wrapped in God's judgment that's coming, that he's going to bring down. So it constantly, the clouds constantly carry that uh, in there. If you'll look at, even back at Revelation 1-7 when we studied that, it said, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes on the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. <laughs> Jeremiah 4-13, Behold, he comes up like clouds, as chariots, like the whirlwinds. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us! for we are ruined. In Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 3, it says, For the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. 
So this angel that we're reading about in chapter 10, he is bringing that judgment with him. The angel is coming uh, to declare judgment on the earth, and that's why he has, has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. It's the whole earth that's coming up under the judgment of God. He has a rainbow. That rainbow uh, that circles his head, that rainbow is, represents the covenant that God has with his people. <laughs> and God's judgment, it, it, what he's, the symbolism means is God's judgment is about to be unleashed in keeping with God's covenant that he made with his people. So the clouds, judgment, <laughs> the rainbow represents the covenant. Land and sea, the earth is about to receive that judgment is coming from God. So <clears throat> he has this little scroll. Now this is the scroll that had the seven seals. But now it's called a little scroll. What's the purpose of it being from a scroll down to a little scroll? We got one, one trumpet, one trumpet left. One. But what's the little scroll mean? Why is it little? Y'all waiting for me to tell you, aren't you? Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. We're good. Um, so, before you get there, remember I talked about this some last week. <clears throat> There's seven thunders. Now, you have to know about the seven thunders. Because there are all kind of theories and ideology just floating around about these seven thunders, okay? There's books that are written about the seven thunders. There are podcasts made about the seven thunders. There are people that get their PhD about the seven thunders. Did y'all know that? Yeah, there's, there's a, one of those shows are out right now. God's going to tell you about the seven thunders. What can you tell me about the seven thunders? Here's the deal about the seven thunders. Okay, let, let me do this. I've got it up here, I believe. Here's what the, the seven thunders, and I put not explained. Okay, there's a reason for that. Here's what we know. The mighty angel calls out with a loud voice, and the sound was like a lion roaring. The seven thunders are similar to the seven seals and the seven trumpets containing, containing a message of judgment. John is about to write down what the seven thunders, what he heard the seven thunders say. That's, well, that's a tongue twister. Okay. A voice from heaven then tells John to seal up what was said and do not write it down. Y'all, that's all that the Bible says about the seven thunders. Everything else you might hear about the seven thunders, they don't know because it is sealed up and John was now not allowed to write it down. Does John know what the seven thunders say? Well, yes, he does. Nobody else. A similar thing happened to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was called up... Or, he says someone was called up to heaven, and what was told with it to him, he's, he said it, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but he said it's humans, our human minds, we're not allowed to, have, to know about it. There are some things that God says we don't know, or we are not allowed to know yet. Okay? So there's things that happen in heaven that are not allowed to be explained to us on this side of the Jordan. We just got to deal with it. Okay? It means it has nothing to do with your salvation or God would have said, John, I want you to write this down and make sure everybody knows. This has nothing to do with how you become a child of God. This has nothing to do with your faithfulness or your obedience. It has to do with judgment and you're not allowed to know about it. You just have to get over it. So if somebody comes up to you, and I've had that happen, believe it or not, I've had somebody come up and try to explain the seven thunders to me. And it's like, well, where did you find that? Well, 
Well, I hate to tell you, but I, we had that for our sermon last Sunday. And I got it from my Bible notes. Well, what were the Bible verses that explain the seven thunders? Because I have missed it. Can you please explain it? Well, it wasn't like that. He was just explaining it to us. You know, that's false doctrine. Okay, I, I would have got up and, and ran, not just walked. I would have ran from that place. Don't let people try to mislead you if they're trying to put a false doctrine on you, number one. Number two, ask them, can we study this a little bit more? Because somewhere they've erred off. And that's where you get these crazy movies and crazy books and all this crazy coming out from people just not looking and putting it in its context. Everything that you study in the Bible must be put in its proper context. Okay, back to the Revelations chapter 10, verses 5 and 7. It says, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, and there would be no more delay, but that the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel. The mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So this is very, make sure you're taking really good notes here because this is really deep, okay? We've had six trumpets. The seventh trumpet is about to blow. When that trumpet blows, everything that was talked about or told by the prophets would be fulfilled. That's what we know from those verses. There's nothing in it about the future. It says everything that had been told by the prophets. There's nothing in there. So what happens is people will go to Ezekiel and they'll take Ezekiel who's prophesying about the Christ and what Christ fulfilled in his prophecies and they mix it. And they try to mesh it together and it just doesn't work. But that's where the problem comes from. What he's saying here, what the angel has just told John, is when that seventh trumpet blows, all will be fulfilled. That was talked about by the prophet. Well, the prophets. Which prophet is he talking about? Well, he's talking about Daniel. In chapter 12 and in verse 7, you can read about the prophecy where Daniel was told to seal it up for a time's time and a half. Okay? So in the future, Daniel, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Now we know when it's going to be fulfilled. Because now when that seventh trumpet blows, Daniel's prophecy that he was told by an angel with the same resemblance as talking to John right now, is fulfilled. Who is it fulfilled against? The big question. Who? Look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1. It will let you know who this is being prophesied against. Prophets that gave a prophecy. So it's not referencing the prophet, but the prophecy. The prophecy that was given to the prophet in Daniel chapter 12. But who is, who is mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that lets us know that this fulfillment is coming against the Jewish nation? Okay. <clears throat> How do we know from reading Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that this prophecy in Revelation, that when this seventh trumpet is blowing, is about the Jewish nation? Okay, 12, verse 1. Keep reading that. Read that whole verse.
time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Okay. So I'm Jewish, but I obeyed the gospel. Is my name written in the book? Before Christ, I participated in all the Jewish acts of work. I followed the law. I did my sacrifices. I went to the priest and, and sought forgiveness. I did that. I lived faithfully for my God. Am I part of God's people? My name written in the book? Okay, now, to have your name in the book of God, you must be God's people. Remember the 144,000? It just represents God's people. 12 times 12 times 1,000 It's complete. It's perfect religion times perfect religion, and it's complete. It's God's people. There's not a single record of any Christian that got ran through by the Roman soldiers. Their name was written in the book. You get that? Based on the signs, they, didn't they did not. They listened to their Savior from Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21, and they received this letter to their churches as they passed it around, and they said, we need to get out of Judea. And Jesus said, when this happens, when you see the armies coming, you leave. You don't go back down there and try to pack a wagon full of stuff. Mom's china cabinet ain't coming, all right? Your favorite books, leave them. In fact, that jacket you got for last Christmas, don't go back and even get it. You get out fast. And they did. But their name is in the book. <clears throat> there was the feast days that the Jews were participating in during this time. And remember, I told you, Titus said, you can go in, but you can't come out. So they would go in to the city, but they weren't allowed to leave. When they went in the city, that's when they would find out they ain't got no food. They had burned all their own food. And as things got worse, they would jump the walls, and Titus told his men, if they jump the walls, crucify them on the spot. They said that Jerusalem was surrounded with crosses. In fact, they were having to go miles away to even find wood. In fact, even later, even later, as you get toward the Templars coming back, they couldn't find any wood. It was that severe. But not if your name was in the book, because you had left, you had gone. What was left was the wrath of God upon those that chose not to repent. This has been 30, 40 years since the death of our Savior. It's not like he just said, boom, it's going to happen. He gave plenty of time. Bring that to today. Bring that to today. How many people are you working with and trying to, to teach them the gospel because just like this, God's wrath is coming again. And this time there is no, there is no second chance. There is no, I'll, I'll do it later. The wrath of God is coming again. But that's the day of judgment. That's the second question, or the second. Jesus answers his apostles. He talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he comes about and he says, in that day. 
When you see in that day, that's judgment. That's the one that there is no second chance. I think part of the tears that our Savior shed in the Garden of Gethsemane was because all this time man had another chance. The first covenant, he had another chance. Christ comes, there is no other chance. This is Ian. Yes, sir. Paul, do you think in the last 30, 40 years we've kind of gotten away from teaching on the wrath of God in our, in our worship and our, from our preaching and focusing on the grace of God? I've heard that said over the years off and on. I, um, where's Meryl? Hey, Meryl. I love you. Um, uh, it, it's not, I think Meryl's seen this too is why I, I said Meryl. Uh, there is a class right now that they want to come out and teach. Okay, it doesn't matter what you, they want to teach it. How do, uh, some, some guy trying to make money. Uh, some counselor. <laughs> but he said, I can bring your congregation from 200 to 2,000. That sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? How do you do that? You teach people what they want to hear and not what they need to do. Right? I would rather be in a congregation of four people as long as we were all studying God's Word. We need a preacher and a song leader. Well, I got two, okay? I can handle the other two. <laughs> we'll hook up sometime, Richard. I, uh, I, need, I need a song leader. Okay? If we're all doing what God says, God says that God has never been impressed with numbers. Never. So if your whole motive is I want to be around thousands and thousands of people because it makes me feel better, you got a self-examination coming because it's not about you. It's about our God, worshiping Him. Okay? So, but there's a lot of people that fall for that. So as if it makes, you know, if, if it's, to answer your question, if it makes, if I'm trying to preach God's word from a point to increase the size of the people in the room, I need to examine myself. Because God says, well, here's what I want you to preach. I want you to preach Jesus and him crucified. It is. You, you need to, to know that the reason that I can avoid this wrath is through the, His grace. We don't hear much of the wrath of God in our preaching. He's talking to you, Richard. <laughs> 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 but I understand. I know what you're talking about. You, we need to preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. Is that right, Brother Tim? We need to teach people that there is a hell. And how do I avoid it? Because Jesus came and died for you, and he rose on the third day. And I'm not afraid to tell that to anybody in this world. And you can have that too in your life. I'm not talking to you. I know you got it, okay? But they can have it too in their life by obeying the gospel. They don't have, God did not want this to happen. He didn't. That's why the partial judgments are there. He didn't want to see 1.1 million people run through with a sword. That's not God. But he said, it's happening. I've been telling you since, since all the way back and from Moses. This is coming when you turn your back on me. It's coming. They've been warned for thousands of years. Turn your back and this is what's going to happen. He sent his son. He sent his son to die on the cross, and they said, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Remember that part, let his blood be upon us and our children? They changed their story a little bit later, but that's, that's what they said, right? It's there. I think it... Immensely, 
if, if I put God as the center of my life and I obey the gospel and I am faithful to him, I don't have to worry about the wrath of God because of his grace and his mercy. Okay? But do we need to teach more on I think I think you're right. I think we need to I think we need to And you and you can't you would be derelict as a Christian not to forewarn somebody of the consequences of not coming into its grave. So we need I, I agree. I agree. We do. Oh I I agree. If you do not obey the gospel. If that's the approach we take from the start, then we're not going to have to get into the Sure. I'm not sure I'm comfortable. I probably need to change my sermon to the next. Uh, <laughs> 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 You're getting lots of notes, aren't you? You're getting lots of notes. No, but uh, if you think about Joshua, when he had the opportunity or responsibility to lead the people, he was told, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. And he said, do not depart to the right hand or to the left. And you think about that as true north-south. And if you think about it, it's a plumb line that is true north-south. Well, when we go too far one way and we only focus on hell, then it causes people to let go of that plumb line. And what does it become? A pendulum that goes the other direction. And then we only talk about grace. The thing is, we've got to get back to true north and south mm -hmm. and discuss both. I have to preach Jesus, not preach, Jesus. I have to teach Jesus and Jesus crucified. Yes? Oh, uh, you know, right now, people who follow up on all the comments uh, say God is love. And God is love. There's no doubt about it. Our God, in Hebrew, said, is a consuming fire as well. And so there's so much going on about tickling people's ears and let, teaching what they want to hear so they'll follow you with the numbers. But that's not where we okay, so, have to be. Absolutely. No. We've got to teach the truth. And yes. The, yes. the denominations right now are being torn apart by the social gospel that they're preaching. And there's a lot of opportunities for the truth to reach a lot, a lot of people. And, and y'all, I had a young man working for me. So he, he, he now has his doctorate, if that tells you how long ago this was. And when he, he, was, he was with me when he was in high school as an intern. And I was working on a lesson. I forgot what it was even about. But I, I asked him, I said, what is your generation looking for? When, I mean, when we're talking about God and someone trying to teach you the Bible, what are you looking for? And he said, I just want somebody to tell me the truth. He said, I don't want a rock band. I, I, I don't want to go out and somebody tell me fairy tales. I want to know the truth. What does God want me to do to become his child? And I thought, wow. Wow. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's telling people about Jesus and him crucified. Yes, ma'am. It's because we flipped it, and it's like, what can God do for me instead of what can I do for God? Because worship is about me to him, not him to me. He's done his part. That's correct. They've got it, they got it backwards. 
That's right. The generation that we I think your name is saying Paul has a couple of good essays on the grace. Uh, the thing, the takeaway is I'm thankful and I'm saved by grace, but don't make it a license to sin. Yeah. That's, there, there is uh, talking to a lost world that has been inundated with God's going to, it doesn't matter what you do, God's grace is going to cover you when we get to heaven. It's, it's all, this is all a scam. Just wait till we get to heaven. It's going to be, a, no, that's a lie. That's, they have to know. They have to know God wants to extend them grace. He wants to. He loves everyone. That person that you can't stand, God loves them. He wants them to be his child. He wants me and you to go teach them how to be his child so that he can give them that grace. He wants to. He's not a, he's not a mean, hateful God. Look, look at what he did. He tried and tried and tried to get them to come back, and they just refused. They said, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to do it our way. And that, I think that goes back to, to what Emily's saying is like our approach can't be you're going to hell. Because if you're doing that, you ain't going to you, you need to teach them about the love of our God and tell them what he did. Remember I just said he did his part. He did it. He did everything he could to bring you back to him with this, the new covenant. It's, it's bound by his own son's blood. That's how much he loves us. He let his son go to the cross when it should have been Paul Wyndham nailed up there because of my sin. He didn't sin. I did. He took my place. You got to show them the love that God has for them. And then if they refuse, they got to know what awaits them. You need to start with John 3, verse 5. And then get down to 16. I always start in verse 5. Yes, sir. Yeah, love's the only thing that, that survives this world as far as that. Love is the only thing we take with us to heaven. In heaven, faith becomes sight, and our love continues on. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm three minutes over. Y'all don't. Y'all don't get mad at me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You can see that in our, my day, the hellfire and brimstone sermons didn't work. Well, you know, they worked. Well, they they turned off more people. <laughs> they turned off more people than they did because when they hmm. hear that type of sermon. When it's too much, like Emily and everybody's been saying, balancing out, if it's too much to that extreme. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> okay, first of all, when you do a Bible study, you got to know your subject matter first. You got to know what you're doing. Okay, so what happened a lot during that period of time was people heard a sermon and went and tried to teach all their neighbors that sermon without finding out what the sermon was really talking about. You, you got to love people, okay? You got to love people. God loves them, and keep that in mind. God loves them just as much as he loves you. All right, I, I remember when I came into the church, and, and uh, I remember Jerry saying one time, and it reminds me of how I grew up, but God saves people through fear and love. Uh, the fear of receiving wrath. the wrath of God, but also teach the love of God if, you know... And that's the balance to, that Richard's talking about. Right, the balance. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, it reminds me of when, when I was growing up as a kid, my mom would grab a hold of me and beat me. 
And she says, the reason I'm doing this is because I love you. Mm. Well, I was experiencing the fear of God and the love of God in, 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 in a sense, okay? You could have come over to the house and we, yeah, I could have taught you some rock and roll song. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but there came a time in my life when that fear drove me to be saved. And, and then I received the love. But I don't want to live my life in fear of my God. Okay, I don't want to be a Christian because God's, I'm afraid that you know, as soon as I get out of line, God's going to zap me. Well, love removes all fear. It, well, but it's not going to be a very enjoyable life walking around out there thinking as soon as, as, soon as I make this wrong move, I'm zapped, I'm gone, and I need the blood of Christ on me, covering me, to wipe those sins away. I need the love of God, His grace upon me every second of every day. Yeah. I didn't get but halfway through chapter 10. <laughs> it's a great discussion. Uh, I love each and every one of you. We will continue next week.